Welcome to the TDWG Podcast. My name is Paul Davidson. And my name is Scott Norman. And today, we're going to talk about reading, more specifically, uh, reading in 2019, the reading that we've done in 2019. That we done did, because it's That we done did, yeah, because it's 2020 now. Yeah. This is 2020. I'm not, that's my poor, poor Barbara Walters yeah, that, impression. Yeah, did not sound like Barbara Walters. 2020. Anyway. So, uh, so why should we read? Why should you be reading? Not only is it just like, so Mr. Norman, why should we be reading? Um, I would say there's lots of reasons why we should be reading, but a handful of them. To increase literacy, which is not just the ability to read per se, but the ability to understand language and think about language and think about other things using language, all of that. Um, just basically your ability to think, right? Yes. Essentially make you make your thinking muscle stronger. Yeah, I mean it, it's the same thing as like somebody is like, well, why would I exercise? Why would I work out? Well, it makes you healthier, right? It you might not think about the fact that the ache in your knee would be better if you actually exercised instead of sitting on the couch all day, but it probably would. Um, in the same way there are things where you're like, Oh man, why am I having trouble understanding this subject or understanding this conversation? Well, if you had been reading more, there's a much higher chance that you actually are able to engage in that conversation and understand what's going on, if that makes sense. That yes, was a weird it, analogy. It, it may, as, uh, so reading is thinking, or writing is thinking, thinking is learning is one of the things I constantly will say in my classroom over and over and over again, and vice versa. If uh, writing is thinking, that means reading is also thinking, uh, interacting with other people's thoughts. So uh, anytime that you read or write, you're in, engaging those thinking muscles, and that's the one of the big things that you need to work with. And so reading does help you with not just your ability to think, but also with your mental health and a variety of other things. It makes you more empathetic, and it also makes you more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're so attractive. Um, the... Uh... Yeah, the other thing that I would say is, you know, people always talk about wanting to read others' thoughts. Open a book. Mm -hmm. You literally are interacting with what those people think. You are carrying that person around with you. That, Not physically. Now, Suzanne made it a little weird. Like, yeah. I want to read a book by The Rock. <laughs> hey, he he lays the smack down, and that's what The Rock was cooking. Um, that's what I was cooking. Is that a cook? That's not. That's not his book. I, okay. I'd like to imagine that the autobiography of Dwayne the Rock Johnson would be. That's what I was cooking. Yeah, and then at the end, there's just a question mark. <laughs> like, like, like all goes, of this was actually it goes just his entire setup, and then it's just a question mark at the end. Dwayne, we uh, you can send the royalties to 904 uh, King Avenue. Yeah, and uh, we would still love to <laughs> have Jewel, you on Missouri. the program before you become president. <laughs> yes. All right, so how do I read? I, so I read uh, a wide variety of things. I will read – so I tend to read whenever I can. I read first thing in the morning when I wake up. I read during my breaks when I have time. Uh, of course, you know, bathroom, all that fun stuff. I read before I go to bed. So most of the time, if I have some downtime, I try to get a little bit further ahead on whatever I'm reading. So that's how I go about reading. So mostly now I cheat. Um, so I read by listening. Now That's not cheating. I Yeah. The, for our listeners who have listened to our earlier conversations about books, um, that still counts. It still counts as reading. You're still interacting with text, even though that text is auditory. Um, I tend, As long as you're thinking about it and not just letting it wash over you. Yeah, not having it as the TV on in the background, but actually actually paying attention. Um, so my most of my reading now is done via Audible. The one thing that I don't do that with is, like, when I'm reading through the Bible, I still like to have a physical copy in my hand. I guess I'm just kind of old-fashioned to you with that. Um, but with pretty much anything else, as soon as I see a book I want or somebody, like, recommends a book to me, I don't immediately go to, like, look at purchasing the book. I look on the Audible app for if I can <laughs> listen to the book. Um so, See, I'm not like that. Whenever I get recommended a book, I go straight to Amazon, and I just put it to my Amazon wish list. Yeah, and I used to do that. And I think part of the reason that I've stopped doing that is because I have a pretty solid commute every day to and from school, but also because um, my wife doesn't like things that aren't being used being in our house. <laughs> And I have a bad habit of collecting books and your, then not reading your them. Your wife would hate m uh, me and my wife's house. There's so, <laughs> so, so many. Like, like, I have a lot of books, but once I read a book, I bring it to school so it can circulate and interact with other people. Uh -huh. My wife just has, like, Jana Novakovich, she writes these numbered books, like uh, One for the Money, Two for the Dough. I, three is not three to get ready, sadly. 
Mm. But anyway, He's there are a bunch of these. No, it's not. No. Uh, but she writes all these number books, so my wife is obsessed with those, and she's read every single one of those. So we have 26 of these books just sitting in my house, and she's like, no, we can't get rid of them. Like they're, they're, 26 they're, for the tricks? It's uh, Twisted 26. Oh, it broke the model. Yeah. And then, well, you have Sizzling 16. Oh, that's or Something weird. like that. Uh, but yeah, there's those type of books, and I'm like, "Hey, do you want me to bring these to school?" She's like, "No, these are my collection of Jana Vakovich books, and they have Arvanovich books. They are in the number order." <laughs> and so, and she do, and we go to library, so so we just have like I, mountains of books randomly throughout my house. I can understand the wanting to keep the books from a set kind of thing because I grew up with the Hardy Boys. And, I mean, we got into at least, like, the 20s and 30s on Hardy Boy books. And see, then they get written by a different author in their lane. But See, Hardy Boys, for me, involves breaking tables and winning championship belts. So, uh, yeah. more for when the Mr. Massey. I was going to say, see, that was over Ma- my head. That's a Coach Massey uh, podcast uh, example. Uh, but much like you, like, I, I listen to audiobooks whenever I can. Uh, that's a, one way I do eat a lot of books, but I also uh, read yes, the physical copy. Eat. Eat. I read eat. the physical copy, and I get the Kindle copy occasionally if that's the way with, through Kindle Limited and all that fun stuff. So I will read a variety of different ways, and that's how I am able to make my. Uh, in fact, when I once I started doing both physical, audio, and uh, digital copies of it, that's part of the reason why my how much I've read has increased over the years. Yeah, and and we'll get to that here in a second. I. Uh, I will say that the one thing that I miss from physical books where I'm like reading to read the whole book and not reading like a portion of it is seeing your progress. Like Mm -hmm. watching that marker move through the book and then being like, oh man, I've only got this much left. I'm just going to sprint through it. Like I'm going to do it. I've conquered this book. Yeah. And then you have it and you can stack it and you're like, look, I read this high. You know, like (laughs) I have this stack of books. I've done that occasionally a couple times. I've done that over, like I like to do that over the summer. Just say, here's, here's the stack I went through this summer. Uh Uh, And uh, I often, if I get an audio book or a digital book, I will still purchase a physical copy of the book. Because I'm an English teacher, and so I, one of my things I have to do as an English teacher is recommend books to people and be able to shovel that off onto different students. And so that's why I still buy the physical copy, even if I've listened to it or done the digital version of it. Yeah, I, the only time that I'll get both is usually if I have either been given a hard copy of a book or I'm required to purchase a hard <laughs> copy of a book and I don't want like to take the time to read it. Or 1491 and 93, which I've mentioned a million times on here. Um, I bought them, and I looked at them, and I started to read them, and I was like, this is long. <laughs> and so I got the audiobook. And so they're on my shelf, but I have the audiobook. There's nothing wrong with that. So uh, <laughs> we've talked about how I read. We've talked about how you read. So what do we read? Um, for me, I, I like especially for the last few years – the number one category is probably biographies. Like, I, I really enjoy reading biographies. And I used to read a lot of biographies of people who have done since. That's the cheerleaders. Oh. They're invading our bunker. I was really confused. I was like, that, where is that coming from? They're um, trying yeah. to invade our bunker they're, by doing their cheerleading things. They're cheering on top bad, of the bunker. Yes, too bad they can't get in. Yeah. So, um, anyway, we, uh, <coughs> excuse me, or. Er, I used to do a lot of reading of books that uh, were about people who have long since been dead. Then I started being like, man, I really want to understand the brain of these people. And the the first one that I read that was relatively recent, he had passed away right before I read it, but I read Steve Jobs' the Jobs, biography. yeah. And um, I was just like, I'm so curious because I'm into Apple products, like the backstory. And so I listened to that and uh, – then I was like, I want to know about all these other people. So I started listening to, like, Jeff Bezos and all these people that are currently around. So you start off with histories, yeah. and then you have evolved into biographies. Yeah, biographies and just kind of seeing inside people's minds. Like, it's really cool to see that. Um, especially, I really enjoy autobiographies read by the author. Autobiographies, memoirs, I think you would also like, which memoirs and audio, autobiographies are very similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, memoirs are more just telling a story, a personal story, where autobiographies is trying to tell your life story yeah. type of thing. And so I, I, that's one huge category. I also tend to read a lot of like spiritual books. Um, a lot of the books that I've read over the last couple years were things written by folks like Francis Chan. I highly recommend him if you're just interested in, in things scriptural or, or uh, about Jesus at all. Um and uh, some Billy Graham and, you know, just spiritual 
<coughs> excuse me, things. His, though, was an autobiography. I was I wanted to get in the brain of Billy Graham because it was right after he passed away. And I was like, yeah, let's learn about this guy. Um, and so if you are a significant figure that has recently died, Mr. Norman's I'm about probably, to jump into your head. I am probably going to try and figure out what you thought. <laughs> um, so uh, those current presidents, like I, I did uh, George Bush's, um, biography, and that was actually... Oh, the autobiographies by the uh, recent presidents? Yes, I haven't done uh, Obama's yet. I, I'm That's in the queue. Have um, you done Clinton's? I have not. I've done part of Clinton's. Interesting thing about Clinton, his birth father, his biological father, mm-hmm. died outside of Sykeston. Really? In a car wreck, yep. I didn't know that at all. That's cool history. I mean, not, you know... <laughs> sorry, Mr. Clinton, I don't mean it that way, but, but meaning that that's interesting. That's uh, no... The one not to you know not to spend too much time on this, but the the one that I found incredibly interesting was George Bush's decision points because it isn't telling a story; it's just telling how he made a bunch of the decisions that he's criticized for while he was president. And so, decision points to me is incredibly interesting because there's a lot of stuff that I rail against as a teacher that he did, like uh, the No Child Left Behind. Oh yeah, and. <laughs> Nickel B. I hear his, like, his explanation. His, yeah. And his explanation, because of the information he was receiving from his advisors, I can totally see why he made the decision to push that thing through because of how he was explained that this would affect the system. You know, things like that where it's like, okay, I, you know, you were talking about empathy. I can now understand, okay, I get it. I see why you wanted this to happen because I now see your perspective on on pushing it through. But so those are those are my big things. Uh you know, things relating to Jesus. Um, I'm trying to think of any other specific shout-outs I should give. Charles C. Mann, uh, he's the guy who did the 1491-1493. Um, and we had a podcast over that that you can listen to. We did. You can go back. Uh, what, what happened, happened to the Native Americans. Yes. And then um, shout-out for sure to um, a uh, – oh, I'm now brain farting on his name – the guy who wrote the Jobs biography. And then I also read The Innovators, it's, uh, uh, Isaacson. Isaacson, Walter yeah. Isaacson. Um, so Isaacson, great author to read as far as biographies go. Um, and then uh, Francis Chan, for sure. If you want older stuff that is still related to that, uh, C.S. Lewis. Mm-hmm. The screw tape letters are awesome. I love the screw tape letters. Uh, just listen to that relatively recently, too. So that's, that's the kind of stuff I read right there. Yeah, I read everything. I read. Uh, I read. Uh, the. It does not matter. I. It traditionally for the longest time I read sci-fi and fantasy. That was my kind of go-to, and it's still my go-to. If I really just want something that I know that I'll enjoy, mm-hmm. I'll try any random sci-fi or fantasy novel. Uh, for the when I was a teenager, it was more sci- uh, fantasy, and then I have evolved. Uh, then when I got into my twenties, it evolved more towards sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now, as an English teacher, I read anything and everything. Uh, in fact, uh, as we mentioned earlier, I started off uh, just reading physical books, but I implemented audio and digital books, and my numbers increased. So I started. To, I, I actually keep track of every book I read. Uh, you do it too. You just don't do it by year. I do it by year. That way yes. I can make sure I how I follow along with the Goodreads total. And I started doing this in 2015, and in 2015 I started. I read 18 books. 18 books, so a little over a book a month I ended up reading. And then in 2016, I read 20 books. That's whenever I introduced uh, the audio, the digital, and I eliminated some other aspects of my life. I didn't listen to as many podcasts. I cut down the amount of uh, TV shows I binge watch and try to keep up with. (laughs) And uh, a wide variety of things. And my number (coughs) ended up skyrocketing, uh, skyrocketing up to 42 in 2017. I just have to ask. You have a lot of books on your list by Douglas Adams was 42 intentional. <laughs> it was not intentional. And uh, the Douglas Adams is just this year. Okay. Uh, I had, uh, and I'll explain that. Okay, I'll explain it now. I had read the original Hitchhiker, Hacker's Guide to the Galaxy uh-huh. book. And I liked it. And I was like, this is a good, solid book. But I'm the type of person that if I read a book, I just read the first of it to understand what the series is about. Uh-huh. And I don't have to like go in and read the rest of the series. Yeah. If I feel like it, I will. I went to Alton, Illinois uh, with my wife, and we just kind of did a day up there, and they had this bookshop that famously talks about how they had Abraham Lincoln and uh, Elvis Presley who came and like bought books from that bookshop. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm like, I'm going to go buy a book from that bookshop. <laughs> it's a used bookshop now. 
And I went in there, and the one thing that they had was the entirety of all, all four of the Douglas Adams books. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, if I'm going to have any books from the bookshop that uh, both Lincoln and Presley uh, <coughs> got their books from, it's going to be Hitchhiker's Guide. So I got my entire original Douglas Adams uh, quatrait of uh, – hitchhiker's guide from that bookshop and that's why i was like i guess i need to read the rest of hitchhiker's guide now yeah I, so that's why there's a lot of uh, douglas adams on this, on 2019 hitchhiker's guide was trippy enough for me i've stayed away from the other ones it's more of the same it's fun yeah i mean it's goofy yeah it's, it's goofy but it was just kind of like an acid trip of like it's weird it's all get out then uh, in uh, 2018, uh, I took a step back a little bit. I started my master's that year. And so instead of 42, I ended up hitting 39. And this past year, I actually hit 34, which this was the entire year of taking six hours of master's coursework from uh, January to December. So uh, 34, I feel, is still a pretty decent number. And the number is actually higher than that because if you have listened to previous podcasts, you know that sometimes he will read a book, physical copy, then listen to it, and then read it again, and then listen to it. Like so. Yeah, I only count a book once uh, for yeah, reading he, it once and not the 14 times that so, I read it. Uh, which one was it? Was it the uh, Black Kids Sitting Together at the Cafe? Yes, I read that like yeah. five times. Uh, if you want to be te- – I don't even include the t- books I teach on this list. I only okay. included one book that I, te- I taught, so that number could even be even higher if you, <laughs> if you yeah, wanted to go so, crazy with it. So that's not how many – that's how many unique books he has yes. read this year. <laughs> How many unique books that I've read for the first time this year. Yeah. (laughs) And so this year, in 2019, I ended up reading 34 books, as I said. And I'm going to hand out some awards. Okay, what are the highlights? Here here are my recommendations from what I have read in 2019. So we'll start off with the honorable mentions. Okay. The first honorable mention is one that we did a podcast over, The Crossover by Kwame Alexander. Mm -hmm. That was... uh, I went into that book not expecting to love it and it was amazing and I loved it and I highly, 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 highly recommend it if you can get the crossover by Kwame Alexander. I have not got the sequel yet, but I will get the sequel eventually. I will get the sequel eventually. It's on my uh, wish list. I just didn't, haven't bought it yet. Okay. Uh, The next one that I would highly, highly recommend, uh, a YouTuber, Hank Green. His bro- I've read all of his brother's books. John Green, I read all of his John Green books. Uh, he's an excellent YA author and, I, author. and I was like, you know, I'll give Hank Green a try. Mm-hmm. I'll see what his book, uh, an absolutely remarkable thing by Hank Green. I will see what it's like. And it was really, really fun. Mm-hmm. It's a sci-fi kind of mystery novel that kind of looks at how the internet works. Mm-hmm. And there's like different different planes of exist uh, like weird like there's a dream existence there's the real existence there's the internet existence and he plays around with these different ideas and these different realms in such an interesting way that the the story overall uh, is a very enjoyable story it's not necessarily the most deep story that you'll ever interact with but it's a fun idea that's explored in a fun way and I highly recommend it if you enjoy just a quick romp an absolutely really remarkable thing by Hank Green so quick question on that one and that is for I know a lot of our students have read books by his brother they're nothing like a john green book okay so i okay uh, how to put it john green i like john green Mm -hmm. i really do but he is a more of a teenage angsty type of author Mm -hmm. he's because he's a ya author this is more of a science fiction book Mm -hmm. and so it has a little bit of green brother of green family a personality to it Mm -hmm. but it's not as teenage angsty ish so maybe closer to my alley then, because I'm not a closer person. to your alley. Yeah. Uh, this is not a book I read this year. I read it actually, I think in 2015 or 2016. I can't remember which year I read it in. Uh, I re- my favorite John Green book is Paper Towns, and it's fun. Uh, it's about being a teenager, and I enjoyed it a lot. And I think you would actually enjoy Paper Towns a little bit. Yeah, I, there's more of a mystery novel, a uh, mystery to it, and it involves like geography and whatnot, and Black Santas. So, <laughs> Paper Towns is fun, and I would recommend if you were to ever actually read a John Green novel, read Paper Towns. Okay, note taken. All right, uh, final. Uh, uh, oh, and to help out with absolutely remarkable thing. Essentially, there's this girl, uh, and she ends up becoming a YouTube, a famous worldwide internet celebrity <coughs> because she uh, makes a video in front of a giant uh, statue. Okay. And then the statue, weird things happen with the statue. Okay, so that's your teaser. That's your teaser for that one. Uh, If you wanted a teaser for the crossover, go listen to the crossover podcast. Yeah. Uh, Last honorable mention, uh, The Underground Railroad by uh, Colson Whitehead. Uh, It is a historical fiction. It's a historical fiction what if. What if the Underground Railroad was an actual 
railroad because the underground railroad was not a rail it was not a railroad that was underground it was just a secret connection of networks that would help get slaves from the south to the north there was and occasionally they'd get on like an above ground railroad but this imagines what if the underground railroad was actually a subway that someone installed underneath the ground and uh got slaves out via that way I see. And it's an interesting what if. It's a really good piece of historical what if fiction, and uh, it's it it captures. I I would and the main character is actually a runaway slave that is a female runaway slave, a woman, and it it's usually not one that you would see. Uh, it's a voice that you often are not uh, introduced to and exposed to. So I highly recommend reading the Underground Row by Colson Whitehead, Whitehead. And I do believe he won like a Pulitzer or something oh, along okay. the lines for that particular one a couple years ago. Wow. I, uh, yeah, I remember having a little bit of a conversation with you about that one and, uh, <clears throat> I'm amused by the concept. Um, but I, for some, I just have a little bit of an aversion to historical fiction because I want my brain to be like full of historical facts. And I'm always terrified that I'll start quoting the historical fiction. <laughs> I trust me. This historical fiction is not going to pollute you, because uh, mainly it's written from a perspective of a bottom, a, a Marxist type of. A, it's one. It's fiction, so it yeah. didn't happen. But it's written from a Marxist approach, where we look at it from a not a powerful people of history, but from people that were at the bottom and what they had to do to survive and type of type of history. And so I think that's what makes it a little bit better, and probably would not pollute your uh, views on that. All right, so there's some recommendations. What are your top hitters? All right, so I, my book of the year, I divided this into two categories. I have an educational book of the year, okay. and I have an overall book of the year. Let's start with education. The yeah. educational book of the year is When Kids Can't Read by Kylan Beers. Uh, that was I had to read it for my uh, foundations, or not my foundations, my uh, uh, strategies for the struggling reader uh, master's class that I took, and it provides a lot of good information about how to teach English, how to teach reading, uh, different ways, different strategies, and different ways to think about uh, things when it comes to uh, literacy education. Excellent book. Best book I've read about education since uh, 18, 000, uh, 17 thousand Classrooms Can't Be Wrong by John Annetti. Highly recommend it uh, when kids can't read by Kylan Beers. The other one, the overall, the creme de la creme, the number one with a bullet. Numero uno. The Ballad of the Risk Whiskey Robber by <laughs> Julian Rubinstein. Now you did tell me about this one, but give the synopsis. Just give the basics. What was that about? Well, let me let me first start this off. All right. So this is the last book I read, or the second, the penultimate book that I read this summer. Uh, and in, uh, the entire summer, I had been reading uh, essentially why all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria. A good book, but a very heavy book. And like the light in their eyes by Sonia Ni- uh, Nieto, and uh, all these like masters uh, pedagogical texts uh-huh. uh, that are very hefty. And whatnot, yeah. and th- interacting with the Ballad of the Whiskey wa- Robber was a like dr- breath of fresh air, a drink of like refreshing water. <laughs> it was it, just what the doctor ordered. You, you could have gone with whiskey there, or yeah. So <laughs> this is a true story. The Ballad of the Whiskey Robber is about a true story about this guy who is a amateur hockey goalie <clears throat> in Hungary who ends up becoming a bank robbing folk hero. <laughs> Really, that's all you need. To that's all you that. need. But Rubenstein does a really good job of writing the story. It is a, I would say, is more of a creative nonfiction. Uh, so it does, he does try to see what it would be like if he was in that particular position. So this is not necessarily a 100, it's not an autobiography type of approach to it. It's, but it is close enough to what actually happened that it will, it, it, you get the story. You understand what's happening. So it's an artsy bio. Yes, it's an artsy bio that is fantastic. Fan, this guy ends up robbing like thirty something banks, <laughs> and like he shows up uh, like with like flowers for the women uh, that are behind the teller that he's robbing, and he's like, "Here's your flowers. Give me the money." <laughs> <laughs> and you missed. He just did the motions for handing the flowers across and then sticking a gun out. So. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun, and like they show up on like America, like the Hungarian America's Most Wanted, and like he starts like sending it coded messages to them, like they'll never catch me, and like making fun of like the police constable that, in the city that he's robbing. Like it's fantastic. It is um, it was great. He even gets caught and he escapes. That's awesome. <laughs> he gets caught and he escapes. It's kind of reminiscent <laughs> of uh, Catch Me If You Can. Kind no, of. because catch me if you can. That guy's really smart and like a uh, con artist. Yeah. This dude is just a goofball. A goofball that robs banks. 
All right. So this he, is he takes advantage of it being hungry after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay, so it's less about his ability to evade the police and more about the inability of the police. Exactly. Okay. Like he single-handedly increases security for banks in Hungary over a five-year period. Whenever he first did it, started robbing banks, they had like one camera, and a lot of banks didn't even have cameras. By the end, of, by the time he's done, banks have like multiple cameras on multiple exits. They have time-release safes and all kinds of crazy stuff. Like double keys to unlock the safe like he single-handedly improved hungarian bank security <laughs> so he's a hero yeah oh people loved him because they <laughs> hated the government they were like we hate the government they're stealing our money these westerners coming in and not even caring for us and uh-huh. this guy coming and stealing their money hooray this guy so he's he's a robin hood that kept it <laughs> he's a he's a robin hood that gambled it away oh that's what makes it even more hilarious <laughs> is that he just drank and gambled it all the money <laughs> oh gosh it is a fun book. It is, I, it is that, an awesome book to it, read. It is one that I genuinely, I do. it is on my eventual list. Oh, you list. really need to read it. It's it, on my eventual list. It is fun. You know it what? is so much fun. I'm sorry to cut into to your overall book, but I'm going to throw out, talking about fun books, one that I did read over the last year that I just thought was great fun, and that is uh, a book by Carrie Elwes, and it's called As You Wish. Okay. And it is the stories from the set of The Princess Bride, which if you are a longtime listener to the podcast, you're probably tired of me talking about. But the actual uh, book, the audio book on Audible is read by all of the actual actors, obviously, Ooh. with the exception of Andre the Giant, who has passed away. Um, but they do a very awesome like tribute to um, Andre the Giant there in it. Anyway, it's a I highly recommend it, and it's incredibly short. So it, it's 100% worth it. All right. Uh, so any so right now, Mr. Norman has the list of all 34 books that I read. Outside of my honorable mentions and my award winners, do you have any questions about any of these books? Yes. One question that is kind of like the Douglas Adams question is Kurt Vonnegut. All over the list. I love Kurt Vonnegut. Who is this guy? You don't know who Kurt Vonnegut is? I've never read Kurt Vonnegut. He is a satirist. He is a humorist. He is a He wrote <laughs> Slaughterhouse-Five. That is his most famous book, Slaughterhouse Five. I've heard of that. Yeah, he he he's the author of Slaughterhouse Five. He's just really funny. Uh, he's uh, very insightful, and his books are really short. Uh, he's a talented writer. He's probably my top three, probably my number two writer of all time. Okay, so when you say uh, talented humorist satirist, are we talking Dave Barry, or are we talking like something else? Probably something else of the best. Uh, how, who could be a Kurt Vonnegut? Uh, I can't think of another person that would fit Kurt An Vonnegut's shoe. So know, I just have to pick one of his books and. and read yeah, it. you just have to read it. He he's he gets out there sometimes, but he's not. He doesn't get out too out there. He he doesn't take himself too seriously. Yet he writes interesting ideas. Okay. So Kurt Vonnegut is uh, that's the reason why he's all over the list. I love Kurt Vonnegut. He's my second favorite author. All right. So behind he's, Neil Gaiman. I've never read. You never read Neil Gaiman. Mm-mm. There's certain books of Bill Gammons you'd like. Um, so the other thing, or a couple other things that I noticed, one that just kind of like, um, <laughs> we had conversations with Angadi about his OCD about watching uh, Star Wars mm-hmm. and like the order that has to happen. In the middle of your list, Return of the King. Oh. Uh, like just by itself. Yeah. I start, uh, so, uh, yeah, I had read bits and pieces of uh, The Lord of the Rings when I was in high school. And so I start, at, but I never finished it entirely. Uh-huh. And so I had never finished like the last <laughs> Lord of the Rings book. And so I just this year I finally got around to finally finishing the Return of the King. But you didn't know what happened. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. I would assume you I watched pre- the movie. Yeah, I prefer the Hobbit anyway. Oh, absolute hundred percent. If you are trying to read J.R.R. Tolkien, just read, read the, the Hobbit. Hobbit. Just yeah. the, that's all you need to read. Um, it's just the Hobbit. And I, I actually, when I was, I think. I read The Hobbit when I was probably in eighth grade, and I absolutely loved The Hobbit. I thought it was a great book. And, and then I was you like, tried to read The Lord like, of the Rings. There's more, and I made it through, like, I think maybe I made it through The Fellowship and, like, part of The Two Tower, but I was just like, this is not near as fun. Yeah. Like, this is not near as That's what enjoyable. happened to me in high school, and then in my 20s, I decided, you know what? I'm I'm an English teacher. I can power through a lot of books, I'm just gonna. Back. I'm just gonna finish the Lord of the Rings finally. Yeah, I would. I would say uh, now. Some people might hate me for this recommendation. If you want to know about the Lord of the Rings, watch the movies. If you want to know about the Hobbit, read throw the, the movies in the trash and wa- read the book. Yeah. The problem with the Hobbit movies is that it takes longer to watch the movies than to read the book. 
it's because they try to throw in all this stuff from the Cimmerillion that's yeah. not in the book and doesn't make it better. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, sorry, that was that was all opinion. All right, so that was one of the questions. Um, one of the other questions was past watch the redemption of christopher columbus what is a student actually recommended me this book it's by uh uh, orson scott card and basically it's a time travel book in which people have the ability to look back into the past and like see what's going on in the past Uh and then they figure out and then they pinpoint the time that human history kind of like was worse Mm -hmm. like made human history kind of like the worst like what could be what one moment in history they could change that would allow for the most suffering that happened in the world to not happen mm-hmm. and they choose Christopher Columbus's voyage to uh, voyage across uh, his finding his disco- quote unquote discovering of America they didn't just snipe Stalin nope they didn't snipe Stalin 30 to 50 million deaths anyway oh well, well their their argument is uh, because of Columbus he brought the Slave traders, oh, slavery. The, yeah, uh, the slave trade, the suffering, okay. the disease, and whatnot that killed all those pe- that killed all the d- indigenous people there, and so they point pinpointed that if we change that, that would be the biggest thing, and so they go back in time and they try to change that. I see. See, I was, I was thinking, I was like, man, because I'm someone who used to be like, well, you got to understand the time, you know. And I will say yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people like to villainize Columbus because of that particular thing of him coming over and being the person that brought the the white imperialism to America. This book does a good job of showing the complexities of Columbus as a man. I don't tend to villainize him for bringing the diseases that would have happened anyway you know, when I talk about him in class. Don't tend to villainize him for like causing the slave trade, although he did... Uh, did do part of that in initiating the slave trade. I tend to villainize him for cutting people's tongues out when they wouldn't bring gold. Yeah. He was he was such an awful guy that literally his crew mutinied and ditched him on an island, and then he enslaved the people of that island. So, you know, anyway, but it is, he's an interesting character to look at historically for it sure. It shows that if a lot, and it kind of deals with that a little bit, saying that these certain people that are around him are the ones that kind of polluted him towards a particular direction uh-huh. and how when he originally did it, he did it for actually a noble purpose. And if we yeah. avoided those people, how he could have been a different person. Yeah, you you can very definitely see if you look at the things that he said about the voyages. When he started the first voyage, it sounded very noble. And then as he went, like every voyage got worse. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could see that. That would be an interesting perspective yeah it's an interesting thought experiment was it a great book it was okay um so that was i actually thought it was going to be a history book trying to explain away the the things that columbus did um so as far as anything else on this list i think i had one more i'll have to read turning point at some point that's another it's all right it's a Basically, Jimmy Carter, his first election he ever won, he had to like initiate a re- recall and discovered a bunch of dead people voting. Oh. Um, I just want to read something by Jimmy Carter because everybody I have ever talked to that was like part of the election of Jimmy Carter, um, you know, around in, in actively participating in politics, are like, he wasn't a great president, but he was probably the nicest president we've ever he had. He comes off as a really nice guy in so, the book. He comes off as a nice guy. Um, so anyway, that's I would, I'd be curious to know more about Jimmy Carter. But... Uh, I think those are my questions from your list. Honestly, the one that stuck out the most to me was just Return of the King all by itself. Um, if there was anything else that I would like recommend for you to possibly read, yeah. There There by Tommy Orange is very interesting. Uh, it's about a modern Native American experience uh, experiences and not Native Americans on the reservation, but Native Americans in urban settings. Mm-hmm. So it's a group of people that you really don't hear from too often. And uh, for you, I think that would be about it. Yeah. Okay. That would be about it. So, yeah, I would recommend that. Oh, okay. You asked about Kurt Vonnegut. Uh huh. If you want to read the one, if there's one Kurt Vonnegut novel that you might be interested in reading, it's Mother Night. Mother Night is about a guy who is he is an American citizen, uh-huh. and he goes over and joins the Nazi army to be a publicist for them because he's a spy for the Americans. Oh. But. The per- his contact for uh, for the president mm-hmm. dies. And so he ends up having to live the rest of his life as a war criminal, even though he was a spy for the Americans. Oof. So you said he's satirist. Yes. So like what, I mean, if it's not giving away too much of the book, what is he targeting with this story? 
he is kind of targeting like the the double sided nature that uh, like uh, certain political things can be, mm. where uh, how we can villainize certain people, even though they are not necessarily deserving of being villainized, and kind of like how how things in wartime end up working and end up not working out for so- other people. Okay. I get I, if, if there's one thing he's directly kind of being uh, trying to address, I believe would be the Nuremberg t- trials that were happening at that time, and how some of the wonkiness that was going on with some of them. Yeah, they, they were, yeah, I, I would I I would probably find that interesting because that is an interesting section of history. So, um, so we've seen you've seen uh, much more in detail, of course, since we've got the list here. Uh, what Mr. Davidson has read through, kind of a handful overlook of what I've read through and uh, seen some of the questions I had for him off of his extensive list. Well, I guess not as extensive as 2017, but still a pretty extensive list of reading. Um, The last thing that we really want to do before wrapping up here is to tip our our cards a little bit towards the future. Um, And that future is February, actually, in which we will be introducing a new podcast. Yes, it won't. We might publish a, uh, the first couple to the TDWG feed, but they will not be officially TDWG podcast. It is a different podcast that we're going to try out. Uh, do you want to tip the name just yet? Uh, I'd be game to tip the name. All right, it that's is all. Teacherpedia. Yes, so we will be doing the Teacherpedia podcast. We'll have a lot more information coming on that. And that will be a much more teachery podcast. Yes, so for those of you who are students, you can listen to it, and you'll actually probably gain a lot greater insight into what your teachers are thinking. But we're not going to uh, entertain your tomfoolery on that podcast. That's what this podcast is for, is for your tomfoolery. So uh, we'll continue to do this podcast. Do not worry. Yes. Do not worry. This is our baby. This is our sandbox where we come to play. Yes. My, the other one is where we uh, wear our tuxedos. Yeah. My favorite uh, way that you've described it is on this podcast, we are Godzilla stomping around the city. On not on that podcast, we are, you know, buttoned up and proper. Yes. Um, so we will be addressing things that, uh, well, we'll get into it. We'll, we'll tell you more later what that one will be about, but just know that it will be targeted at teachers um, and the things that they would have questions about. So Teacherpedia podcast is coming, but for now we will keep stomping around the yard here. Yes. So until next time, take a look. It's in a book. It's reading rainbow. LeVar Burton.